you spent a tremendous amount of, in China. And I, I wanted to ask about China and then also about your, the, the, the situation you see with women and girls. But you must be the most interesting expert in the world on Deng Xiaoping because you negotiated with him for years. And you were recently at a remembrance for him and his family and, and so forth. <clears throat> and as we know, Deng Xiaoping is the architect of modern China. Tell us about that time. Did you have any idea that China would become what it is today? Well, I don't think either I or Deng Xiaoping knew what was gonna happen in the future, although he had dreams of it. The same week that we both announced that we would normalize relations after 30 years of estrangement, Deng Xiaoping announced reform and opening up. And that's brought about incredible changes in the life of 1.4 billion people now all for the better, I think. But um, Deng Xiaoping was a remarkable reformist. And when he said reform and open it up, he meant, meant it. So I go to China about once a year. <clears throat> and um, this year happened to be the 65th year of my first visit to China. I was a young submarine officer in 1949 and went up and down the coast just before the communists took over. And it's, just, it's also the 65th year of the founding of the People's Republic of China, which happened on my 25th birthday. So I'm 25 years older than the People's Republic of China. And uh, it's 110th anniversary of his birth and my 90th birthday. So we had a lot to celebrate this time when wow. I was over there. But Deng Xiaoping, when he became uh, the leader of, uh, of China, which happened actually during the year we were negotiating, 1978, uh, he wanted to bring about a lot of changes. And uh, he has, totally transformed uh, China internally because it was completely uh, oppressive then. No, nobody in China had a, a liberty to go from one village to another. Nobody had a job. Nobody could keep a single dollar of outside income except what the government gave them. And now it's one of the thriving economies on earth. And uh, at the final uh, banquet that we had at the White House, he said, Mr. President, you've done a lot for China. What can I do for you? And uh, when I was a little boy, the number one heroes on earth were the Baptist missionaries in China. I gave five cents a week to build hospitals and schools for little Chinese children. And so I said, okay, you're a communist country. You believe in atheism. You don't permit religion at all. You don't permit Bibles to be distributed. You don't permit uh, missionaries to come in. I want you to change those three things. And he was kind of taken aback. Wow. And I'll tell you, I have to let you know later about that. So, <laughs> so the next morning he said, okay, we'll change the law of China to permit freedom of worship. And we'll permit Bibles to be distributed this year. I won't let missionaries come back in. <laughs> so, so he did that. And now uh, China has the largest Bible publishing company on earth. It's the fastest growing Christian nation in the world. Really? It's now the third largest Christian society on earth. Soon will be the second largest. And of course, China has now become a thriving economy as well. The first thing he asked me to do on a big scale was to supervise the court of Senate, to supervise the elections of, of village leaders. There are 650,000 villages in China and about two thirds of the total people that lived in China during the 12 years that we did that uh, live in little villages. So we initiated and then revised so that all of those little villages now for ever since 19 1982, have had absolutely free and fair and open democratic elections. Uh, everybody in the village is registered to vote when they're 18. They expect to vote, men and women. Uh, they have, a, they have a, a chance to serve for three years. They don't have to be a communist. Uh, they uh, have an absolutely secret ballot and, and they can run for re-election if they want to. So the Carter Center had that major responsibility for 12 years. So I, I have seen good things happen in China, although I know that there are many problems now. So it's interesting that in your post-presidency, you focused on at least two significant initiatives. One is the, um, the question of, of honest elections. Yes. And you have personally gone to countries to watch and actually watch polling, yes. right? And again, the, we see from our earlier panel some of the sort of terrible things that happen to people without honest brokers. You've been an honest broker. You worked very hard to eradicate guinea worm from Africa, and we're this close. 
and I, what I'd like to do is ask people to get to the mics because this and, and start getting questions from the audience. So could people go to this mic and that mic? But while they're gathering, the oh, spotlight's on. While they're gathering, um, the question I would ask you is: You've now said and said very publicly that you're going to devote the rest of your life for the terrible to address the terrible things that you see happening with women, women and girls in the world. Mm -hmm. What was it that caused you to take this focus? You've always been a humanist. You've always cared about this. Was there some event? Is there some new opportunity? Is there some change in, in your view of how society is willing to now engage on these issues and address these horrific things? Well, you mentioned uh, monitoring elections. The, the Carter Center started that, that initiative. We were the first ones that did that. And now a lot of other people do it. But uh, we've had programs in 80 countries in the world. and. Rosa and I go to those countries. We're 35 of them are in Africa. And we work with the poorest people and the most needy people on Earth. And as we went from one country to another and saw the plight of the poorest people, we saw vividly and repeatedly that the ones who suffer most are the women and girls. And uh, in Muslim countries and Christian countries, it doesn't matter what the religion is, uh, there is a, a persecution of, of women and girls. If a family is poor, the boys get the privileges. The boys get the best things to eat. The boys go to school. The girls stay at home and that sort of thing. And there's a horrible oppression that's not unknown in this country and around the world, and a lot of people deny it. At this moment, there are 160 million girls missing from the face of the earth, mostly from China and, and from, and from uh, India. This is four times as many people has died in the Second World War. 160 million girls have been strangled by their own parents at birth, or they have been aborted now with the advent of sonograms when the parents know this baby is going to be a girl, she's aborted. So, so that's going on. That's the worst thing. But the other thing is in countries that have been already mentioned here is that genital mutilation mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt and, and Sudan and so forth. Uh, for instance, in Egypt, the mutilation of, of girls' genitals is illegal. But uh, in Egypt, 90% of all the living females have had their genitals mutilated. Oh my God. And in some countries, 97 or 98%, and in about a third of the African countries, more than 80%. And, and another thing is, is a child marriage deal, where you've already heard about that, I need not repeat it. And honor killings is another thing, where girls who are raped, a girl to marry someone that their fathers don't endorse are treated as uh, infidels and they are killed by their, own, by their own families. And it's not just in this country, it's not just in other countries, it's in this country as well. For instance, at Atlanta, Georgia is, it has the largest and most busy airport on earth. We have between 200 and 300 girls every month who come into Atlanta and are sold into slavery, mostly sexual slavery. And the reason that happens in Atlanta is that we have a lot of girls who come in whose skin is brown or black from the Southern Hemisphere, more than we come into Boston or New York or, or Chicago or, or San Francisco. And so you, a, a brothel owner can buy a girl with brown skin or black skin for about $1,000. And in Atlanta, Georgia, New York Times reported last March that their total income from the sex business in Atlanta is 275 million dollars a year, which is more than twice as much as the total drug income. And, and every brothel, every whorehouse in America is known by the public officials. There's no police officer that walks up and down the road or street and doesn't know that that's a brothel. So he's either bribed or gets sexual favors, or his boss, and therefore the mayor and city council says, let's don't rock the boat. So sexual slavery is really bad in this country. The Congress passed a law recently that told the State Department every year you have to make a, a full report on slavery around the world. And, and uh, the, the State Department estimates that at this moment, 60,000 people living in the United States of America are living in slavery. And, and this is, uh, and, and the other thing I'll mention just to be as brief as possible is, is sexual assault. And the two most precious institutions, I would say, in America are our great university system and our military. And, and those are the two focal points for sexual assault. One 
girl out of five that goes to an American university is sexually assaulted, a rape. And very few of the deans and presidents of universities want to admit that happened, so it's covered up. They don't want to admit it. In fact, 41% uh, of all the universities in America have not reported a sexual assault case on the campus in the last five years. And it's even worse in the military. Uh, there was revelations earlier this year by the Congress that 24 million people uh, suffer on, in the military last year before last, that's 2012, from sexual assault. And of those, only 3,000 were ever brought to any kind of accusation or charge, and that's about 1%. So those things happen in America and around the world, and people don't want to admit it. And I think it's the single worst unaddressed human rights problem on earth. And yes, I'm going to spend the rest of my time, and the Carter Center is going to concentrate on this, as well as other human rights abuses. For good reason. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Rob, you want to go ahead? Have our first question. Thanks, Eric. Mr. President, Rob Glazer, it's an honor to see you again. You look great. It's Getting lovely to see you in such good shape. Uh, I wanted to ask about another difficult topic, the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, clearly, <clears throat> what President Obama is dealing with is a wrenching decision on what to do, uh, specifically in the uh, horrible areas of the intersection of Iraq and Syria and those uh, butchers who call themselves ISIS. I'm curious if you have a perspective on what uh, what you think the president should do that's either similar to what he recently announced or in a different direction? Well, when President Obama came into office, I was very pleased because he went to, as you know, he went to Cairo and made a speech and he made another statement that the basis for peace in Israel and, and with Israel's neighbors uh, was the basic things that all the countries on the world agreed to except Israel at this point, and that is to withdraw to the 1967 borders with minor modifications mutually <coughs> negotiated. And one of the pr primary goals in my life for the last 35 years, and I'd say the thing that I have prayed most about, you know, in, in international affairs has been to bring peace to Israel. And you have to do that, bring peace to the, to the uh, neighbors of Israel, including the Palestinians and others. I was able to bring peace between Israel and Egypt while I was in office, but the rest of it has not yet been done. And now we've kind of backed away from that, and, and now it's in, a, it's in a stalemate, and I'm afraid it's going to stay that way for a while. So I, I think the, the root cause of, the, of most of the animosity against Americans uh, among Islamic countries or Arab countries is the Palestinian problem, which has to be resolved. So the Carter Center doesn't get involved in, in, in areas where the president is, is making a, a, a strong move or where the United Nations is there. So we have a, a full-time office in Jerusalem and Ramallah and also in Gaza. So we try to bring the people together and, and work on that. As far as, uh, as ISIS is concerned, I think that we have to address this issue uh, strongly. And, and I have been in favor of what uh, President Obama has said in, in recent months. Unfortunately, I believe that, that President Obama has a lot of persuasion to do to convince the Arab countries and Islamic countries that he is sincere about what he says. And as you know, we don't have a single Arab country at this point to say they're willing to take a leadership role in dealing with ISIS. And, and that's because of the complex nature of it and nobody wants to put boots on the ground so-called. And also a lot of the uh, Muslims in Iraq and other places look on ISIS as maybe better than the treatment they got from the from the uh, government of, uh, of Iraq. So I would, I would say for us to reach out to our, our neighbors and friends to induce Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar and others to support us and, and go ahead and carry out President Obama's uh, present statement. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, <laughs> President Carter. Um, you know about the, the, the slave trade that's happening here. So yes. in your, your former president, that means everybody should know about it. Why are we going around to other countries trying to tell them what to do? And we have this happening in our own backyard and we're acting on it like it, it doesn't happen. The second part of my question. Ah. You're a former farmer. What is your take on GMOs? <laughs> my, my take on what? On uh, GMOs, GMOs genetically, genetically modified, modified organisms. organisms. Okay. Well, uh, slavery, which is now called human trafficking, 
is greater at this point in the world than slavery was in the 17th and 18th and early 19th century. The, 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 number, the amount of money that's traded back and forth now for human trafficking is greater than it ever was in history. And I've already mentioned that, that our country is also guilty of being involved in, 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 in slavery trade. And about 80% of all the people sold into slavery against their will are women who, who wind up in, in sexual slavery. And so that, that's a very serious uh, problem that the world is trying to address. But it's, it's very difficult to get the US Congress to, to take on that issue and admit that we have a problem in this country. And, and, and the only thing that's been done so, so far is that the Congress has mandated the State Department to make a, a, a statement. And, and now the State, the, the, the State Department of the United States grades every country on how much they're doing to resolve or, or, or take care of the slavery trade. And I would say it's, it's very slight. Other countries, it's like what? Ain't that like the wolf garden the hen house? Well, you know, we're not by, we, by far the worst country on earth, but we are, we are set an example. And when we don't take care of it here, other countries say, well, we can get away with it as well. But there's an international law on this that gives teeth to a country that condemns it. And we have not been willing yet at the Congress level to pass the law that would give us a, an ability to put in economic sanctions and pressure on countries that, that are still conducting the slavery trade. And the other question you had was what? Uh, his, your opinion about gen genetically modified organ, and basically think about okay. genetically modified food. I've written a lot of op-ed pieces in my life. The most controversial op-ed piece I ever wrote was about genetically modified organisms. And I think that's one of the best things that happened to the world, is the, is the development of genetically modified organisms. I still am a farmer, by the way. Yeah, we have about 3,200 acres of land, about 1,800 acres of that is in trees, but the rest of it is, is cultivated. And every crop planted on our farm is genetically modified to make sure that it can be more productive and, and that we don't have to use as many poisons to kill the insects. For instance, we used to poison our cotton 20 times during the growth of a cotton crop with the most virulent poison permitted by the Department of Agriculture. And now the GMO cotton seed have built into it a, a repellent to the boll worms and boll weevils so we don't have to poison it anymore. So now we grow cotton without poison at, at all. And, and as you know, th there's another thing that, that lets you control uh, weeds and, and crops. So we don't have to plow peanuts like we used to because we can spray the peanuts and, and, and they, then they don't die. So these are the kind of things that have done. And I think that since we, the world is facing a problem with increased production of food to, to match the increased growth in, in population, I think the GMO should be permitted all over the world and, and not discouraged. But anything that's grown with GMOs ought to be clearly labeled so that people who are against GMOs can buy food that's not, that's not genetically modified. This book is remarkable. The case is so profoundly clear. The numbers are here. The facts are clear. What I particularly like about you as sort of a great American is that you've maintained your personal values, the values that you grew up with, literally Plains, Georgia, right. all the way through the presidency, all the way across the globe, and even here on the stage. You're a truly great American, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much.